Hello and welcome to episode 64 of the Naked Eye podcast. This is Nathan Oxenfeld, and I'm coming to you today on the very first day of fall 2022. I'm really excited about this episode with Dr. Sam Byrne. Before we get into the interview, though, I did want to go through a couple quick announcements, some really cool opportunities this fall for you to get involved with natural vision improvement work. First of which is happening on Tuesday, October 4th. The Color Lights World Project that I'm a part of is hosting the next free event about offering gifts, free gifts to you. There's going to be about nine or 10 speakers offering teachings and insights about light therapy and color therapy and ways that we can access self-healing. These speakers are also going to be offering more in-depth workshops throughout the fall. And my workshop, I'm actually collaborating with Ainoa de Federico on December 1st. It's a Thursday. We're going to be doing a workshop about preserving eye health in a screen-filled world. So if you want to learn more about, you know, turning screens into vision improvement time, that'll be a great opportunity. But to learn more about the free event on October 4th, plus the paid workshops throughout the fall, you can either go to Gabrielle's website, colorbaresh.at, or you can go to my website, integraleyesight.com slash colorlightsworld. Lastly, the second announcement is about Natural Vision Improvement Day happening on Saturday, October 15th. And this is going to be an all-day event going from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern. It's going to feature seven speakers, myself included, and it's going to round out with a big vision teacher panel to take questions from the audience. Now, I know that is quite a commitment to spend all day on the computer, especially after what I just said about, you know, screens and eyes. So if you sign up, it's $39 to attend live on the Saturday, and you'll get the replays and the recordings. So in case you don't feel like sitting there the whole time and, and being there, you can always watch the replays later on at your own time. So for more information about that, you can head over to IntegralEyesight.com slash NVI day. So that's all for now. Let's just head right into the episode. And I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Sam Byrne. Hello, this is Nathan Oxenfeld. And today I'm joined by a special guest who is an optometrist and also embraces holistic approaches to eye care. And I had the pleasure of being interviewed on his podcast not too long ago called the Eye Clarity Podcast. And I really just enjoy following him on Instagram and seeing the bite-sized clips and content that he shares with his community. So just really excited to uh, share him with my community today as well and talk about maybe some things from his upcoming release of his new book coming out as well. So thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sam Byrne. Good afternoon. Good morning, Nathan. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. And maybe before we jump into any particular topics, maybe that you cover in your new book, uh, do you want to take some time to introduce yourself and, and share a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. So I am a licensed optometrist, earned my degree from the Pennsylvania College of Optometry in 1984, a long time ago. And it was a very medically oriented education. And I was very interested in vision therapy, actually the third year of my of my optometry school, I got to do an externship with a behavioral optometrist, Bob Sanit, out in San Diego. And it was amazing to see 60 people a week going through vision therapy and the changes that they made in their life. So it, it inspired me to say, that's what I want to do. And so once I graduated, I went to the Gazelle Institute in New Haven, Connecticut and studied child development for a year and opened a practice in Philadelphia got very busy and sold that and moved out to Santa Fe, New Mexico in the early 1990s. And why Santa Fe? 
Well, one of the other internships I did was at the Indian Hospital in Santa Fe. Mm. And so I knew that Santa Fe was a alternative community that would probably accept a more holistic approach to eye care. And I was right. So I moved here in the early 90s and opened uh, an office and got busy and uh, studied a lot of different alternative things. I would say my philosophy is I, I look at the whole person, not just the eyes. You know, one of the, one of the things is instead of looking at the numbers, you look at the person behind the numbers yeah. and being more in a humanistic approach, both professionally and personally, uh, fast forward today. And, you know, I'm still very passionate about the work and helping people and, um, you know, I'm just into a more integrative, natural approach to health and that people are making their own choices and what they want to do with their with their eyes. Mm. Yeah, that sounds empowering to, you know, be a facilitator, someone to support people along their journey instead of just making all the decisions for them and <laughs> telling them what's right and what to do. It sounds really nice. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I've, I'm originally from the Philadelphia area. Um, so that's cool that you, you started off there as well, uh, before going out to New Mexico. Yeah, Philadelphia was pretty conservative. I remember I affiliated with a, an older behavioral optometrist and I could not get any patients for like three months. I mean, I was beating the streets and this was before social media. Finally, I remember I was moonlighting in West Philly at a eye clinic and he called me and said, you got your first patient. <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is, this is monumental. What I actually did was on City Line Avenue in Philly, there were these hospitals and I went to a few of them and I talked to the physiatrists and I said, I've got this vision rehabilitation type perspective. Can I work with your TBI people? And he said, sure, I never heard of this. And all these people had double vision and balance issues. They were kind of written off by the, you know, traditional eye care. So, right. of course, you know, doing syntonics and vestibular stuff and, you know, prisms and all the things, they got better. And then I started working with special needs kids. And so those two communities created a reputation for me that then I started to build my practice indirectly it was a great lesson because in the end, before I sold my part of the practice, I built up a very uh, busy vision therapy practice in a very allopathic section of the main line in Philadelphia. I mean, it's very challenging, mm -hmm. but you know, that proved to me that you could do this work anywhere. And uh, yeah, you know, New Mexico was, was easier um, because uh, people were, the, the community was so much more, open to it you know in philadelphia it's more conventional and i remember even yoga and meditation they were in the early phases you know back in the late 1980s of course now you know yoga is great all over the world um so anyway philly was a great um learning place for me and, a, and i and i really refined my chops of being able to communicate and talk to people and um, you know, I was very grateful to my partner, Dr. Edelman, Dr. Ellis Edelman, he passed away, but I was like an apprentice with him for, for five years. And so mm -hmm. I, 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 this was back in the eighties. And I remember I met, uh, Jacob Lieberman and got involved in Syntonics. I'm really grateful to meet Jacob. And then I got Ellis involved in Syntonics and he actually got on the board and he was even more mm -hmm. excited about it. So we did. We did a lot of great things, you know, very innovative, um, way ahead of the curve in Philly. And um, I was really glad to to be there and um, learned a lot. And it's kind of my base for, you know, what I do now, what I draw on with a lot of my content that I put out and people that I, that I help. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the syntonics because I was going to ask if that was something that you encountered in optometry school or when you were starting to look more into vision therapy, but sounds like um, that kind of came in a little bit later. Yeah. So in optometry school, the 
uh, pediatric head was a guy named Mitchell Scheiman, and he had his uh, other associate, Mike Galloway, and they were um, very conventional. But, you know, I learned a lot about the accommodative convergence model of, of vision ther therapy, but we didn't really go into light. Uh, it was when I got out of school, and I think Again, I was traveling, uh, I had met Jacob and we were traveling out in California together and he was speaking at different places. I remember we ended up at Esalen and he was speaking there. And so he was really my introduction to light and color. And then I started to go to the meetings and met Ray Gottlieb and Larry Wallace and some of my contemporaries, Mark Grossman was another person. And so we we kind of, you know, really took the syntonics model and I loved it. You know, it was just yeah. a great way to, as you know, and of course we've got our, our friend and colleague Gabrielle, um, who's in Austria and she actually spoke at my health summit and she, what she's doing with color and light is just incredible. So a lot of people do in light and color. I've seen some of your, content on it and i'm really glad that you know people are embracing the therapeutic value of light and color because it's pretty pretty potent stuff and it's so simple yeah 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 it's and for, for those who maybe um they may not be as familiar with what syntonics is or syntonic optometry um do you want to give a quick little crash course or or a descriptor of what that is, what syntonics means. Yeah. So syntonics comes from the word syntony and it's spelled S-Y-N-T-O-N-Y and it brings bring back into balance. And Harry Riley Spittler was one of the founders of syntonic optometry back in the 1930s. And basically it's using different, looking at different frequencies of light through the eyes. And by doing that, it stimulates the photoreceptors in the retina. And so it can open up your peripheral vision, but it also has some secondary effects because they're non-visual pathways in the eyes where that energy, that color and light impact the endocrine system, the nervous system, our emotions, our psychological. Um, those of you that believe in the chakras, it can you know, alter those. So it's, um, it's a modality that that you can use to help people improve their vision and beyond. I mean, there's so many other benefits, the research coming out on what, what light and color can do for our pH levels, our, you know, our inflammation, our pain. Um, now, red light therapy is one of the, the things that I'm looking at as it affects the mitochondria in the retina. And some new studies are showing that you know, a, a dose of three to four minutes of looking at red light in the morning might actually improve your vision. This is coming from, you know, pretty mainstream science. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, the College of Syntonic Optometry, if those of you that want to learn more about it, you could CSO, you could go there, find a practitioner in your area and, um, or, you know, keep following us. And I know Nathan puts out a lot of great info on light and, um, so yeah. yeah isn't there so a that's, website that's basically um, isn't that csovision.org in case people yes, want that's right check it out yeah it's a great resource and um you know the books light medicine of the future by jacob take off your glasses and see by jacob um really good books um again uh you know there's more and more being written about color and light these days and uh it's 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 uh, the new medicine and uh so i'm i'm happy to be part of the the group absolutely yeah and just to reiterate i just love how simple it is by taking in certain colors looking at them through the eyes can have these systemic effects elsewhere in the whole system so pretty pretty amazing stuff and is that a topic that you incorporate or touch on in your new book. You just brought up Jacob Lieberman's books, um, but I wanted to bring our attention back to your book as well. Um, it's called mm -hmm. Vital Vital Vision. Is that right? 
Yep, Vital Vision, and it's coming out February 2023. So in this new book, actually the way I wrote this book is interesting because I've written five, five, five other books. But in this book, what we did was we did some research on what were the most popular topics on social media. We did research on all the, the platforms and you know, the number one question that I got was about floaters. Mm. And the second most important question or most popular question was what do I do with my cataracts? Yeah. And the third question was on myopia. Uh, and then astigmatism was like fourth. And then it went from there. A lot of questions about pinhole glasses, a lot of questions about uh, diet, nutrition. So I, I put in color and light in those different topics. Uh, right. You know, it's so much part of my fabric that, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I can't not, not talk about it. Um, my first book, Creating Your Personal Vision, I actually wrote two chapters on light and color. And um, my book, I Sense, at play in the, uh, the the field of healing, I actually bring in another energy measurement called the GDV camera. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. This was, mm -hmm. uh, this is a camera that was invented by a guy named Konstantin Kordkov, who's a oh, yeah. professor of, of um, yeah, um, energy medicine. Mm -hmm. And he invented this Curlian type camera. I bought it. And I started to do research with energy fields and chakras as it related to syntonics. And when I was teaching at the Esalen Institute, I had a whole group of students that uh, we put through different color and light therapy uh, protocols. And then we'd measure people using their energy fields and chakras. So people like Joe Dispenza and um, Bruce Lipton and Greg Braden, you know, those people are really cutting edge in health and the paradigm around energy medicine. So to be able to see the change in the field or the chakras or the acupuncture meridians through color and light is pretty profound. And in my book, I Sense, I, I talk about the research. This book is more of this new book is more about what do people want to what are their questions? Right. And so so I just we took the transcripts and then I rewrote it uh put it together had many people read the book to to help me you know put it together so it's it's kind of a compilation of what do people want to hear you know what are they most interested in and it's interesting that floaters was number one at least in my community what is it in your community do you know what what are what are, what are the big questions people are asking you because it's yeah. probably different yeah I, you know there's some similarities and some differences because yeah, I do see a lot of floaters questions come up, especially recently. Um, it seems like more, more recently compared to in the past. Um, but probably the, the most common question I get more so than like what particular vision condition is more about the time. <laughs> a lot of people just, uh, seem to want to know exactly how long it's going to take or what what is involved in the process uh, which i i can resonate with because i know that i was wondering that myself when i was first looking at this process for my eyes um but yeah i would say floaters and cataracts are are two really common ones i think the mm -hmm. other big common one i get is people who have gotten a laser eye surgery and then lost some of the benefits or the results from that and then they're kind of in a pickle because they might you know could consider doing another surgery or they want to maybe explore a more natural option so that that's another one that i i see a lot in like my youtube comments and things like that but it's such a good idea to yeah. see what people are talking about you know what people want to learn more about and just give them that and answer the questions that are actually pertinent. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to create value for my community instead of just talking about myself, you know, that's not going to go anywhere, but LASIK surgery is interesting. You know, you bring that up because I did a post on TikTok about six months ago 
and it was on LASIK and how I do, what do I think of LASIK? And I came out against it and it went viral. The whole, I mean, it just blew up and mm -hmm. almost all of the comments were against what I was saying. Oh, LASIK has worked great. I'm so happy, blah, blah, blah. Where's the science? And there was an article that was written in the New York Times, I don't know if you know this, in 2018, that came out against LASIK surgery. And Morris Waxler, I don't know if you ever heard of him, he used to work for the FDA, and um, he was one of the people who approved LASIK surgery. You know this, maybe your community doesn't. So I shared that, and it shut people up. They were like, oh, my goodness. And it's not that I'm against LASIK surgery. I think you just need to be really informed about yeah. what are the side effects and because you know if you're high myo um the only way you're going to get there is through lasik surgery i mean at least in my process i cannot help a person who's you know over minus four minus five how much myopia can they reduce so in that case all right you know that that'll get you there and then you can do your method or my method as a way to integrate what the eyeball prescription has become but, you know, it's definitely, you know, tricky waters compared to cataract surgery, which mm -hmm. is a really safe surgery. And that one works out really well. Um, you know, the other question I get a lot is monovision, you know, where you're correcting one eye for distance, one eye for reading. Mm -hmm. And that seems very disastrous for many people, you know, and, they, and, and then they're trying to wear progressive lenses and, you know, gets into all those, those areas. And this is where you and I understand what vision really is. And there's so much of the brain and the body involved and there are ways you can improve it. Um, so, you know, we can offer that perspective that I think in the traditional mainstream eye care, they basically just say, well, this is the best we can do. And, you know, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll get used to it. Something like that. Yeah. And so. I know I was not aware of what mono vision was before I started learning more about vision and i was yeah pretty taken aback by this possibility that we can essentially get one eye to focus near and then the other for focusing far and on the surface it sounds like oh that's a good idea but it when you really think about what that does to the to the brain and and the visual system and how i mean it's amazing that we can adapt to that but kind of like you just hinted at it's like what what do i actually want to get used to what what do i want my brain to adapt to um so mm -hmm. coming coming back to the the floaters topic though since that is a, a popular topic did you want was there anything in particular that you wanted to um share around that topic well a few general principles that patience is a really important component if you want to embark on reducing your floaters and you may need to try some different things, you know, not, there isn't one cookbook approach for everybody. Right. And, you know, people get frustrated pretty quickly if, you know, this doesn't work or that doesn't work, but usually floaters, you know, it's been cooking in your eye for a while. It isn't something that just showed up. It's, you know, the vitreous gel in some way has lost its integrity whether it's too watery, whether it's dried out and it's shrinking. There's a collagen issue. There's an inflammation issue. So take your pick. Is it dental care? Is it head trauma? Is it liver issues? Is it just dehydration and, you know, oxidative stress? There's so many factors involved. Uh, so, you know, I think about collagen creation, hydration, giving more nutrients to the eyes, protecting your eyes from, you know, the drying out agents like blue light, uh, looking at your systemic and metabolic health as well. And it's a puzzle, you know, you're in a, you're in a detective type uncovering, um, you know, I wish, you know, I have these eye drops, MSM drops. And if you look at my patient reviews, some people have reduced it, but that's, you know, I, that's not the magic bullet. It doesn't work right. for a lot of people. So I'm very conservative about even saying, okay, use these eye drops and they're going to get rid of floaters. The same thing is with laser surgery. I, I've had a number of people who've had the laser surgery for floaters and it's created more problems, more cloudiness, more inflammation, uh, on and on. 
So I think if you've got floaters, I think to start looking at it systemically and metabolically, maybe mm-hmm. adding, you know, agents to the eyes that are more natural, natural eye drops, moisturizing, you know, your diet is part of it. And let's see, you know, what you can, you know, what you can do with it. So um, that, that's kind of how I approach it. And I'm not out to make any guarantees or promises that if you do this, it's going to fix that. That's just not the way I roll. Yeah. But, um, yeah. You know, that's, that's, and, and I've I mean, taken, uh, do you have anything to add? To it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. But, but first I wanted to mention that I I've taken MSM in the past, like orally for, I think it was just for like joint health for my knees or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're, but you blended it into an eye drop where it just goes right onto the, into the eye tissue. Yeah, it's a sulfur molecule. It's organic and, uh, you know, it's in a, a, a just a, a liquid solution and they're different percentages. Um, and sulfur is the third leading trace mineral found in the body. Sulfur is like sticky fly paper. So it, the toxins will stick to the sulfur and then it can be flushed out. So as a detoxifying agent, one needs to be careful if your detox pathways are not working very well and you start using MSM eye drops, it could create a little bit of irritation, blurriness, redness. Well, that's because your detoxification pathways are overwhelmed. So mm-hmm. you have to use less of it or a lesser concentration. Mm-hmm. And then I get the question, well, I'm allergic to sulfur. And there's a confusion there between sulfur and sulfa drugs or sulfites. Mm-hmm. So I have to make that distinction as well. And then for, for many people, the, the MSM eye drops does help them. It does create more moisture and lubrication. And it's, it's a therapeutically driven eye drop that um, seems to, to support some people. So, you know, I've used it in my office for many, many years. And then in 2016, when I opened my e-commerce store, I said, all right, I'll put it up and see how it goes. And it really took off. It was and I have a mist, so you can spray it on the eyelids as well. Uh, but I want to also say it's not the cat's meow. It's not the the magic bullet. And people yeah. will write me and say, can I use MSM for reversing cataracts? Well, no, that's not what that's going to do for you. Uh, you have to do some other things like reduce your sugar and, you know, yeah. do some other things like that. So it's it's one of many things probably just like you you have tools in your toolbox and maybe you have some different tools or more tools and it can help people and so that's the bottom line and you know the msm is one of many things that that can be supportive for people so yeah and i love that that's how i see it of how it, it acts as that sticky paper and it can attract the toxins and flush them out because that's sort of the language that i use sometimes around floaters is you know what can we do Mm -hmm. to flush the floaters out and you know it's like if we're thinking about physically dealing with the floaters or or flushing them out or breaking them up or or dissolving them in some way that's one side of it and and from the baits system I, I really love getting people swinging a lot and doing movement practices mm-hmm. to really stimulate the lymph system uh, mm-hmm. to kind of get mm-hmm. that cleanup crew involved and and just get the flow of the fluids going and anybody who has yeah. floaters knows that when you do swing your head or your body or you move the floaters move as well so w- that's kind of what i did with my floaters it's like if I'm just staring and straining, they're just like stagnant and stuck in my eye, but through the swinging Mm -hmm. and the movement, it's circulating and potentially sloshing those fluids around and and kind of moving things, shaking it up. Uh, But I also appreciated how my vision teacher, Jerry and Tabor, whenever I asked about my floaters, she would advise me to keep working on my myopia because the more Mm -hmm. my eyesight cleared up and I could see better in the Mm -hmm. distance without my glasses, even if there still were floaters in my eye, I wouldn't even notice them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, the brain Mm -hmm. has this ability to like see through them or to tune them out in a sense. 
So I, I kind of had that twofold approach. It's like, yes, I physically want these things out of my eyes, but also I want to just keep focusing on my goal here of just getting more and more vision improvement. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to go because, you know, when your vision improves, like you say, with your myopia, then everything changes. And um, I, I would probably say with a lot of people who've had success with floaters, it's partly due to the fact is they're not aware of them anymore. They're still there, right. but it's not bothering them. And, you know, that's that's part of the deal as well. And just the fact that you were able to improve your myopia, well, you you now have a belief that when people come to you, you you know it works and you can you know you can kind of help people just from your energy just like well i've done it so you can do it and you know that's what i'm looking for with um you know how i how i help people is to be able to you know all right am i walking my talk am i really is this really happened or is it something i read in the book you know mm -hmm, and uh, mm -hmm. uh again um when we read it in the book, um, it's it's an idea that's out there, but we're not really embodying it. And what you say about the lymphatic health is so true because uh, for most people, their lymph system is pretty stagnating. I mean, jump on a rebounder a few minutes a day. What does it do to your eye pressure? Well, it might bring it down. It might reduce your floaters. Long swings, which is one of the exercises is on my eye clarity exercise program. I love long swings. It's so great. Uh, so movement, it really helps stimulate um, our our health and um, we're sitting too much. You know, yeah. that's kind of part of the issue, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's been getting more publicity lately. The other thing I've been experimenting with is supplementing with bromelain, uh, the uh -huh. digestive enzyme found in pineapples. And yeah, there's been mm -hmm. some studies suggesting that that can potentially help decrease floaters. So I just got a mm -hmm. bottle and I'm starting to try it myself because based off what you just said, I don't like to just read about it. I like to have a personal experience with it and, and try it out myself. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bromelain is really, uh, I think it works well. I've, I've used it in a number of patients and uh, so that's, that's something new that's come on the radar, which I think is, is great. So, yeah, yeah. you know, we're always looking for those new things that might, might help. You know, I, I get a lot of questions about scar tissue in the eyes. Oh yeah. And I experimented with natokinase and serapeptase. And in some people, they actually work when they supplement with those, uh, their, uh, I, I, uh, scar tissue does reduce. And so people with retinal detachments or iridectomies and, you know, all these surgeries where you're going to get scar tissue, um, th this may be a way to, to help people be able to see things more clearly. So, um, you know, Sorry, it's very exciting. The, what were those things? That sure. You so nat natokinase and serapeptase. Uh, those are two supplements with serapeptase is a digestive enzyme mm. that um, can actually help remove some scarring and eye scarring. There's been some studies, small studies on that. Cool. And some people are a little sensitive to that digestive enzyme. So then you could use natokinase instead, which is more of a supplement. Mm. And uh, cool. so, We've been using those for for the scar tissue that sometimes occurs after a, a, an eye procedure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Cool. And and you did just also bring up cataracts not too long ago as kind of a common issue that mm -hmm. people run into. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned how the cataract surgery is is also an option. But yeah, are there particular mm -hmm. things that you have people kind of try out before going down the surgery mm -hmm. route? Well, if it's an early stage cataract, we try to determine where the cataract is in the lens, because based on where the cataract is in the lens, we might use a different treatment. So for example, if somebody has a cataract that's around the edges, that's called a cortical cataract, it looks like spokes that is related more to a glycation issue where the glycogen 
uh, the glucose molecule has bonded with the protein molecule in the lens. So it creates a cataract that's more based on glucose problems, mm. whether it's diabetes or prediabetes or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we might use uh, something like carnosine or N-acetylcysteine, or we might use the CAN-C eye drops. Mm -hmm. uh, th those would be some, some things to start with. Now, if the cataract is more in the center, is it in more in the front, the nuclear cataract, which is more of an aging cataract or the posterior subcapsular cataract? In those cases, what I have seen that works, again, early stages, is using the Oculamed uh, eye drop, which has glutathione and vitamin C in it. Uh, so glutathione is a big player with lens health for me, and I'll have people supplement with a sublingual liposomal glutathione, boost your vitamin C, get a buffered one to 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. Uh, those, those are, you know, no-brainers. And then if you want to use the topical eye drops, uh, CANSI or Ocular Med or the homeopathic Cineraria, certainly you could do those. Then you'll know within a month to three months, whether things are getting worse. And, you know, I did a podcast recently on the question I get about cataracts is, you know, 95% of my patients get better with cataracts, but it's that 5%, they start doing these things and their cataracts get worse. Mm. And so that was the question, that was the podcast. And this, the cliff notes of that are that maybe the healing is for you to just get the cataract surgery. Right. And, you know, there's some parameters you want to go for. Try to correct both eyes for distance. If you're nearsighted, try not to become farsighted. You know, if you can right. talk to your doctor about staying in that, you know, because nearsighted and farsighted people think differently. They yeah. process differently. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, you know, do you want to get the multifocal lens? Do you want to get the astigmatism lens? It depends on your lifestyle and, you know, how much do you have? And, you know, there, there are factors involved that I actually walk people to the cataract surgery and inform them. Some of the intraocular lenses don't have blue light in them. So you want to make sure if you get the intraocular lenses that you're now protecting yourself with blue light, either through you know, doing some lutein, zeaxanthin and astaxanthin or uh, blue blockers or a screen, you know, just being aware of blue light a little more if you've had cataract surgery. So there, there are things that you can do. But, you know, I remember my dad, my dad did my my program for like 10 years. And then he was in his 80s and he, he was having difficulty driving at night. And so we hooked him up with a surgeon. He got cataract surgery. And, you know, for the last six years of his life, he died at 89. He was driving at night. He was happy. He was, you know, so yeah. um, I recommend cataract surgery. There, there are times that I think, it, you know, it, it, it works better. If you have a mature cataract and these, these things aren't working for you, don't struggle with it. Just go get the surgery. And uh, there's some things you can do preparing before and after, but uh, it's, it's, they've done so many of them that, you know, chances are you're going to have a really great outcome mm -hmm. and move on. That's the healing, get the surgery, move on. Yeah, that's really important because, um, you know, we, we don't want to get too stuck in, in just one, one way of thinking or one approach. And sometimes mm -hmm. I like to remind people that allopathic is contained within holistic, you know, holistic isn't just ignoring one part. It's, it's taking it all into account. So yeah, I think it's good to be realistic and, and know when it's time to incorporate some type of surgery like that into the, the natural healing process as well. I mean, I, I think what's really great about the Bates work is that, you know, somebody goes for cataract surgery and then you can give them a prescription of palming or sunning or long swings or whatever is in your, you know, in your repertoire. It's going to totally help their healing. You know, they're going to they're going to get their eyesight back in even a better way by doing your exercises, you know. So what a great thing as a physical therapy after the surgery that you can be there for them. And that's what I because it's so simple. Oh, palming. Okay. That that's pretty easy. I can do that. I don't need some piece of equipment. <laughs> I'm the equipment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've watched some of your videos and 
appreciate the simplicity of what you're teaching, but also it's profound. If people actually do the work, they're going to heal faster. And, uh, you know, with surgery, what a great gift to offer people because they've got anesthesia, they've got antibiotics, they've got steroid, you know, they've got all these things they got to be taking. So here you're helping them through circulation, oxygenation, relaxation, you know, more self-awareness. Um, it's a great, it's a great compliment. And that's exactly what you're saying that holistic lives in allopathic and allopathic lives in holistic and they're, they need to be, you know, together. It isn't just where we've got this polarity and this polarity. Yeah. That doesn't work. Right. right. So, right. <laughs> and, you know, so I love it. Dr. Bates himself was an eye surgeon. <laughs> you know, he performed right. eye surgery. Yes. And, and so he, you know, that was like a one-stop shop, right? You could get your surgery and get your Bates practices from the same guy. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty, it's pretty broad, broad band, you know, in the early 1900s to have a doctor, that visionary to be able to be that broad. I mean, I, I kind of wish today some of the surgeons offered that kind of perspective um, instead of this more narrow. So that was one of the things I loved about Dr. Bates was that that broadness that he had. He did it all. <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was a wide spectrum, right? And in the 1900s, I mean, that was a long time ago and here way ahead of his time. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think it's cool how, like you you mentioned the history of syntonics, you know, starting in the early 1900s as well, 1930s you know, and, and Bates was knocking around in yeah, 1920s. And yeah, it's, I can't help but wonder, you know, what the world would look like today if things like syntonics and the Bates system were even more accepted and studied and embraced, um, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to kind of being kept out of the mainstream in a sense. That That's why, you're such a, a a valuable person because you've you've got that background in optometry and you've kind of got you know a foot in in both worlds and and you're creating this connection for people to not only explore all these amazing natural alternatives and and empowering practices but still have the support of an optometrist to you know work with different prescriptions if needed and and that whole side of it so yeah I just love what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm a very uh, strong supporter of people getting prescriptions that improve their vision. And this is where I sometimes get a little frustrated with the eye care field because they're not willing to help people reduce their prescription. Now, there's these online places you can go. I mean, there are ways you can get around it. Yeah. But wouldn't it be much easier if, you know, Jane says, look, doctor, can I get a prescription that corrects me to 2040? Or can I get, you know, a single vision lens instead of this bifocal? And just the resistance that, you know, this 2020 that we need to have it. Otherwise, you know, it's irresponsible to be seeing through something less than that. You and I know the value of a reduced lens and how it, it impacts people. So um, I, I definitely advocate that, you know, it's why I keep my licenses current and believe me, yeah. I have to take hours and hours of courses in pharmaceutical drugs and surgery yeah. just to keep my license current. But it's so important to have that voice out there um, so that I can do that for people because um, I think it's an important component, you know, think about your own case and your own myopia, how you were able to step it down. And now you're 2020 and you're, you're doing great. And, you know, that's, that's what's needed in the process. So right on. Yeah. And, it, and it's all. so, yeah. it's almost so common sense because like just quick story. I was on a phone call last week with uh, there's the, group here called the Vermont Small Business Development Center, kind of helping out mm -hmm. entrepreneurs and, and small businesses to grow. And 
Mm -hmm. it was just my first chat with this volunteer who works there and he's just trying to get a sense of, of my business and my practice. And I love talking to people who have no idea about natural vision improvement or how this world works. So his first question was, are you an optometrist? And I yeah. said, no, I'm not an optometrist. Um, and then I explained how, what the bait system does can sometimes even help you reduce your prescription over time and, and get some improvements. And so his question was, oh, is this something that your eye doctor would be able to recommend for you like oh hey you know you've got this option you can get these glasses or there's this set of vision therapy practices you can try out and and we can see how that works and unfortunately i had to be like well no that's not really the the way it is right now <laughs> you, you probably won't learn about these types of things from your eye doctor but the fact that just him coming up with that idea and the fact that it was just such a like, oh yeah, shouldn't it be this way? Uh, mm -hmm. Like just to a lay person, just really reiterated how the world just needs more and more of this and how on board so many people would be if they just learned that, oh, there's just a, a simple set of things I can do that will make a tangible difference here. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, m yeah, more power to your voice getting out there as you know, an optometrist yeah. who supports this, this work and, and really continuing to put out, you know, proof that, that this can make a big difference. Yeah. I haven't been able to penetrate the eye care community <laughs> yet. Uh, certainly penetrated the, the consumer, but not the professional. And the other professionals are all in on it, whether they're naturopaths or functional medicine doctors or acupuncturists or massage therapists or whatever, but the penetration into the eye care field with that concept is, um, you know, I'm working on it, but I, I haven't, I haven't done it yet. And, and I think social media might be a way to create enough of a, uh, a need for it or demand that maybe then, you know, there'll be some change. Uh, sometimes that's how you have to, do it through the grassroots, but anyway, I was just going to say um, that. So, yeah, feels like a, a grassroots movement where it, it's a process of individual people learning about it, talking about it, mm -hmm. and and essentially demanding it from from their doctors. <laughs> you know, it was really funny um, when I first opened in Santa Fe, and I was reducing all these prescriptions. It was before I was filling the prescriptions they were going to lens crafters and lens crafters actually instituted a policy that you could change your lenses i think within 60 days um if you wanted to if your eyes improved like because they saw all these people where their prescriptions would reduce and i don't know whether they're still doing it or not but um it was a it was kind of mind-blowing to me that they actually would do something like that but um that was that was the only place and that was the only time and uh you know it's exactly the grassroots is where it's gonna uh have to change that's an inspiring story though because it's like yeah if you can you can influence that you know even if it's just one franchise of a larger chain but but still it's like you know the results mm -hmm. are speaking for themselves yeah yeah, they are for sure. But that uh, I, I did also want to just reiterate what you said, how it's important for people to find a prescription that supports them and actually leads to improvements. Um, and, and that's just one thing that sometimes if we're only if we're over focused on some of Bates's approaches and writings, I, I'm sure you have encountered I've encountered as well, people who just don't wear their glasses at all and take that more cold turkey approach. And I definitely experimented with that myself where I would really test the limits and really go long periods of time without my glasses. But I I would still put them on when needed and I would still give my brain that clarity in certain moments and times. So I just wanted to kind of reiterate what you said and just anybody listening who might feel resistance to putting glasses on um, it may actually help you progress to the next level, especially if you have the right strength. 
and and probably like a reduced strength like you're talking about sam so yeah that's really true uh when i'm counseling people whether they're farsighted nearsighted astigmatism doesn't matter it's great to have the step down in between because you're now interacting with more than just total blur there's some there's some detail and there's some peripheral and it's important for your brain to relearn that's that next step of reduction and for you to feel that gradient oh this feels more relaxing and also to be artful about when is the circumstance i wear those so i'm not going to wear the reduced prescription if i'm driving at night and we're in a rainstorm i'm going to wear that say if i'm hiking in the daytime or i'm you know playing with my kids or i'm gardening and then the other the other side of that of course is I have people wear the opposite prescription. Now that's mm. done in the therapeutic setting. So nearsighted people wear a farsighted prescription. Farsighted people wear a nearsighted prescription. Yeah. And in a therapeutic setting where there's no visual demand to uh, invite people to start to be aware of mentally, what are they thinking when they immediately are confronted with that level of blur gives them a sense of the programming that they're actually doing to their own eyes but it's just kind of under the radar. And so, you know, when you wear a plus lens as a nearsighted person, and I'm talking like plus three, plus four for a short period of time, and then you take the lenses off, you're gonna to start to get more uh, naked visual acuity and same for farsightedness. So I think you can use these lenses very creatively, therapeutically, and to have somebody like you or me counsel them to say, okay, let's do the, the small step down. And then you these other times you need to go without them or you can wear the opposite lens prescription. You know, so people start to hook into their awareness about what they're thinking, what they're feeling, how they're moving, how they're reacting with these different lens prescriptions. And that turns their eyes on. They get more conscious in, inside their eyes. And that ultimately will stay with them forever once they make that crossover and that's why that's why it works um so you know i think we're in agreement there with that and it's such an important part of reducing refractive error you know you have to be able to come down a little bit at a time and again the word i use is patience you know for most people they've had these visual conditions i always say to them how long have you had them oh 10 years and you're expecting to change it in, you know, two weeks, come yeah. on, you know, I mean, change a little bit, but give yourself a break, you know, and it will happen, but you need to set the stage so that you're preparing yourself for that opening and it, it you right. need to be, the more patient you are, the better it's going to go for you. So that's the, that's the wisdom around it. Yeah. And, and it may may also be the challenge for some people because the the activities themselves you know the different practices and therapies are not difficult in and of themselves but having the patience to stick with it and and really follow through uh that's a different story so but i think yeah the more you understand how the process works and and have a couple ideas of of where you're headed um it can really help you stick with it and follow through especially with some help. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. We're here as stewards and, and guiding, you know, we're kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're taking people on a trip and it's away from the dependency of their, their glasses or contacts or improving their eye health. And, um, you know, I remember when I went through my own vision therapy process, I was pretty nearsighted as well. Mm -hmm. And my doctor, said to me, I'm giving you one practice and I want you to do it for three months. I said, what? No, I can't do it. And basically he said, I want you to use the practice as a mirror to learn about your habits, your belief systems, your conditioning. And that was the, that was the key that unlocked my resistance around, you know, being able to let go of my nearsightedness at the time. I didn't know it. And I went through a lot of resistance around it, but 
it's less about the exercise and more about what we bring to it. I mean, certainly the exercise yeah. is important, but you know, it's bringing that insight uh, that that really is going to create the change. It's not a mechanical thing. No, no, yeah, and and interestingly, I I feel like a lot of people probably at some point come to a similar conclusion of like even though I want to improve my vision, I'm resisting it. I'm, I'm, there's some fear of letting yeah. go of the myopia or the strain or the tension for some reason. And it's seems very counterintuitive because it's like, well, wait, that's why I'm here doing this. I'm trying to let go of the nearsightedness, but then there's some deeper thing still holding on. So yeah, I think for, for people to dig deep right. and really find out what those, those resistances truly are, mm -hmm. um, if we can kind of let those, soften up and loosen up and relax, then the vision can change quite dynamically. Well, maybe that's why these retreats and longer workshops allow people to really embrace those deeper things and feel safe enough to do that. Whereas a, you know, an hour session does something, but when they're on your retreat for several days, wow now they're getting to see those habits and they're doing it in a field with others common so that's helpful community and then the amplification of the community and then feeling safe enough to go okay i can feel my vulnerability around what this really means mm -hmm. and that's why those those longer retreats are valuable in being able to create the momentum to make the change that you're you're speaking about Exactly. Yeah. And kind of goes back to before we started recording, we were talking about, you know, wanting to start get back into that kind of thing and, and doing more actual like live in person retreats and overnight stays places. And because, yeah, that, it's like before the pandemic, mm -hmm. I was that was a part of my practice that I was really starting to ramp up and I was doing more like weekend retreats and, and week long kind of events. Mm -hmm. And so uh, yeah, it just doesn't really translate with, with the virtual version, uh, to be able to just spend a full day and night, you know, full weekend and just be so immersed in it. So yeah, keep setting exactly. those intentions to get some more of those things on the calendar, hopefully. Absolutely. Yeah. People are hungry for them. And especially yeah. because we've been in such isolation when, when it's okay for us to you know, the, to congregate again, whoa, watch out. I mean, the level of depth we're going to be in is really powerful. So it's coming, you know, it's definitely moving back into that slowly. So yeah, uh, it's, yeah. We're, we're... yeah. Well, once again, I, I really am not only looking greatly forward to reading your full book, uh, but you also mentioned that you're creating an audio book so that people are going to be able to listen to it as well. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So we're, I'm in the process of reading it right now and getting the, the audio levels and all that. So we'll, we'll release that through audible. So I, because I do get a lot of people that say, you know, I'm partially sighted and, you know, I've got a cataract or this or that. Can I, can I listen to the book? And, you know, audio is definitely, that's what podcasts, what we're doing now, you know, people want audios and how can we, how can we, reduce the resistance so that people can engage with us. Some people like video, some people like written, some people like audio. Uh, so give it to them in as many different ways as you can, and then people can choose how they want to do it. It's funny, you know, I write a written blog and people love that, you know, and there are other people that go, I love the video, you know, mm -hmm. and then other people go, well, I'm jogging or I'm walking in my dog and I get to listen to a podcast. So it's, yeah. it's again, what the internet has done for us to, to be able to reach more people in a variety of ways. So, yeah. Yeah. Everybody's so that's, different that's and, the and requires their own yeah. learning style for sure. So, but yeah, it's special, you know, just specifically how ironic it is in order to learn about making your eyes healthier and better requires your, using your eyes to read a book. So 
to to be able to just listen to it, have your eyes closed or palm your eyes or yeah, go on that walk and and enjoy it is is a really nice gift. So and for it to be in your voice too, that's that's nice as well. And yeah, yeah I just wanted to um express how I really like the title because that word vitality is, is a really good descriptor mm-hmm. of when it makes me think of Margaret Corbett who studied under Dr. Bates and and contributed a lot to the natural vision world, how she would talk about when we have this eye strain or mental strain, it just zaps the eyes of their vitality. And so it just drains Mm -hmm. them of their energy and their functionality. And so when we can learn ways to let go of the stress and the strain and start to feel more relaxation coming in there, not only does that feel mm-hmm. relaxing but it actually gets us back in touch with this vital energy that we c- can now use and utilize and and like you said earlier when your vision improves everything changes everything improves so yeah i think it's uh not only a perfect word but you know since the title of my book give up your glasses for good obviously i like alliteration as well yeah. so you've got the vital yeah. vision there yeah. with the alliteration too so <laughs> props on that yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah, it's important. You know, the, the rhythm, the, the language of it really plays into it. And when we were, my team and I were, you know, throwing together different uh, ideas and we had so many different ideas. And then this VV, Vital Vision, mm. and it just, yeah. it just kind of worked. And yeah, Vitality, right. You know, we look at somebody and we can tell their health based on the light that's coming out of their eyes. You know, they're bright, they're engaged you look at a baby you know or a puppy you know they're so uh yeah so i'm really excited about putting it out there and seeing where it goes and what it does and um you know um you know thanks for having me on and and uh you know sharing sharing with your community and uh you know to be continued absolutely (laughs) yeah collaboration and where where will people be able to find the book when it is released? Well, we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, you know, obviously it'll be on my website, drsamburn.com. Um, we're probably going to do a pre-sale campaign through our social media uh, platforms, and uh, you know, we'll we'll make it available. And I've got a couple of bookstores that I really like, and you know, we'll just see. I've got some good distribution channels. So, uh, you know, hopefully you'll be able to get it uh, in a lot of places, but, um, you know, just stay in touch with, with us and uh, we'll, we'll let you know when we're, we're releasing it. Yeah. And you've got plenty of things to, to keep people busy in the meantime. Um, would you say that would be the main place you would send people is your, your main website and then maybe, you know, like some social media places as well. <laughs> Yeah, so drsamburn.com is a way you can you can always get me. Hello at drsamburn.com is a great email. Uh, so I will definitely get if you have any questions. And yeah, Facebook, Dr. Sam Burn or Instagram or I'm on all of them, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, um, and my podcast, the iClarity Podcast, which is on Apple uh, and Spotify and, and all of that. So a lot of places you can find me and um, uh, happy to help. So I, I answer questions for free and all my content is free. So, um, you know, I don't charge anything. Just type in what you want to learn and my name and something will come up for you that I know will help. So that's, that's kind of, it's pretty easy for people. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, something that I relate to as well, um, just love educating people and putting putting resources out there for free for people because it's just a matter of yeah. of people realizing that this exists and then you know choosing what to do with it from there so yeah thank you so much for all the amazing knowledge you put out and education you share with people and uh and yeah this has been wow. awesome to to chat with you today and go through some pretty pretty powerful subjects and topics 
and want to thank the listeners once again for tuning in and definitely go check out all the things that Dr. Sam's got going on. So thanks again, Sam, for being here. Okay. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye.